it, please? In terms of psychiatry, many people are scared of psychiatry, and they've told me that the images of a clockwork orange come to mind, that psychiatrists have exposed people to these horrible thoughts or horrible ideas and pictures and do terrible things. That's not what happens in a psychiatry office or what happens in a hospital when a psychiatrist comes to visit a patient. Hey GQ, I'm Dr. Eric Bender, and this is part two of The Breakdown. The Dark Knight. Why do you want to kill me? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? Go back to ripping off mob dealers? No, 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 you, you complete me. The Joker is clearly a psychopath. Innately, he just has no love for anybody, just himself. The Joker is clearly doing this to get personal gratification. He even jokingly says to Batman, but he's serious, you complete me. This is about the Joker. This is not about anybody but the Joker. Clearly psychopathic. He's not psychotic. There's a big difference between being psychotic and psychopathic. Being psychotic means that someone has had a break from reality. They might be hearing voices, seeing things that other people don't see. They might believe things other people don't believe, and there's evidence to show it's not true, but they still believe it. That's called a delusion. They might be having very jumbled thinking. That's what psychotic means or what a psychosis is. Psychopathy is very different. Psychopathy is this tendency to just use people in their game. And Joker even uses the word game. This is a game to him. I'm considering it. No, there's only minutes left. So you're gonna have to play my little game if you wanna save one of them. Yeah. Here, the Joker, this is right after these crimes have been committed. There is no evidence that he is hearing things, seeing things, having a break from reality. He clearly knows what he's doing. He tells Batman the specific addresses where Rachel and Harvey Dent are. He's at 250 52nd Street, and she's uh, on Avenue X. He knows it. He's even said, you've let five people die. Ten people have taken over for you. He's clearly of a sound mind here. When you're looking at legal sanity, you first need a mental illness to say, was there a mental illness that caused this person not to know what he was doing at the time of the crime? So we don't have a mental illness, but let's just say that somehow he gets to court and he is going to be evaluated. And somebody argues, well, clearly he's, he's got something going on. True, but again, that's psychopathy. And psychopathy is not a mental illness that would qualify for what's called the insanity defense. In the insanity defense, that means that because of a mental illness, someone didn't know that what they were doing at the time of a crime was right or wrong. In Gotham City, let's assume it's that someone doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. If he were found to have a mental illness that caused him to not know that, he could go to a psychiatric hospital, a forensic hospital, where he would then be treated. But again, he doesn't have anything that needs to be treated. Where are they? Killing is making a choice. Where are they? Choose between one life or the other. Your friend, the district attorney, or his blushing bride to be. <laughs> Here we just see the Joker really loving torturing Batman and hurting other people. That's something that a psychopath really would revel in. Don't talk like one of them, you're not. Even if you'd like to be. To them, you're just a freak, like me. There was an article that came out almost 20 years ago by William Martins, who was a physician in the United Kingdom and it was somewhat controversial called The Hidden Suffering of the Psychopath. Dr. Martins had interviewed serial killers, including Jeffrey Dahmer and Dennis Nielsen. And he claimed that both of those individuals didn't know how to interact with the world. They felt excluded and as if they couldn't figure things out, that no one loved them. They also came from traumatic backgrounds. And Jeffrey Dahmer said to him, per Dr. Martin's report, that there was a point at which he crossed any thin connection he would have to the societal norms. And at that point, he felt so isolated, and that's when his crimes escalated. Jeffrey Dahmer even tried to keep his victims alive. He tried to zombify them by injecting acid into their brains. Dennis Nielsen kept body parts and would even talk to the bodies for hours at a time, write poetry to them even. This shows that psychopaths might, in fact, not understand how to interact with the world. That article was very controversial because people think psychopathy and psychopaths have committed such heinous crimes, should we really have some sympathy for them? The idea was to think, how does psychopathy develop? 
are those traits that we should look out for in people to suggest that they might go down a path towards psychopathy. It's not necessarily to say, hey, we need to be sympathetic, but that's something to keep in mind. What does make someone go down this path of not caring about people? See, I'm not a monster. I'm just ahead of the curve. The Joker saying that he's not a monster, he recognizes what he is, that's very much the way Dahmer and Nilsson explained to Dr. Martens. They recognized what they were. They said, we couldn't show this side to anybody. They'd be so repulsed, nobody would connect with them. They already weren't connecting with the world. So we do think that psychopaths might recognize who they are, how they function in the world, and not know how to do it. The Godfather. But if Clemenza can figure a way to have a weapon planted there for me, then I'll kill them both. Michael Corleone ends up taking on this role of killing Salazzo and McCloskey. He seems to come into this because it involves family. It's the family business. In some ways, the idea that it's a family business justifies this. It almost makes it so it's just a business decision. He can balance out whatever feelings he might have about killing someone with the fact that he's gonna kill them. So that's managing his cognitive dissonance, that, that conflict between those two ideas. At the same time, what's important to know here is that this is almost an acceptable code of conduct in the mafia as presented in this movie. You gotta get up close like this, but bing you blow their brains all over your nice cyber league suit. Come in. Mwah! You're taking us very person. What's presented in the film is that this would be expected. This is a retribution. There's an idea that this is acceptable to some degree. Now, while Michael has to go off and hide in Italy for years because of this, it's not unexpected. It's part of the system. In that way, at this point in the film, he's not necessarily a psychopath. He's doing something that he sees. There's a reason to do it. It's part of the family business. This involves a family, the fact that someone tried to kill his father. It's not a pleasurable event. It's not something that he's getting joy out of in the way that, say, someone who's a serial killer or even a psychopath might get a power and control excitement from. He's doing this as retribution. And in that way, it's not necessarily marking him as a psychopath. It's not legal, so that might qualify him more in an antisocial personality disordered realm, but he's not necessarily showing a lack of empathy to all people. It's this situation that's a business situation that he needs to handle. Tom, wait a minute. I'm talking about a cop that's mixed up in drugs. I'm talking about a, a, a dishonest cop, a crooked cop who got mixed up in the rackets and got what was coming to him. The antisocial personality traits here would be disregard for the law, potentially lying and manipulating, which we know that he does. There is the question of, is he a psychopath? And if we look at all of the different iterations, he would probably be more of that old idea of a sociopath, that the environment in which he's in now as a young adult has created this uncaring person. He still cares about family. So there's that that's going for him in the opposite direction. but. The idea that society and what he's involved in has made him this way, that's different than psychopathy. And it's really a good debate as to whether he would be or wouldn't be a psychopath. There are things that argue for it, such as his violent behavior or ordering people to be killed and not caring about it, just seeing it as business. Whereas there's evidence that he might not be, that he really does care about children and other members of his family. On that side, however, we have seen that psychopaths from the research can feel some care and some concern for their family members. So this one is really a tricky one to parse out. A Clockwork Orange. I'm going to show you some slides and you're going to tell me what you think about them. All right? Oh, jolly good. The exercise that Alex undergoes here is very similar to a study that was recently done with psychopaths. In that study, a neutral face was shown and it was changed into something a little bit more emotional. People who scored high on the psychopathy checklist, showing traits of psychopathy, actually had a harder time even figuring out or understanding what the emotion was that the person was showing. It suggests that they have a really hard time understanding or processing other people's emotions. Here we see Alex give some responses in this movie, what they're trying to show is that he's been conditioned to be less ultra-violent. Those were the terms in the movie. He had been conditioned, meaning 
he had associated something, violent images, that's the scene where his eyes are held open and he's looking at violent images, and Beethoven's music, which he loves, they've been paired together to condition him so that each time he hears that music, he wants to not go near it, or that each time he is exposed to something that reminds him of these violent images, he, he won't want to go near them. That was the idea of exposing him to those things. The boy you always quarreled with is seriously ill? My mind is a blank. Uh, the book. And I'll smash your face for you, your blockos. <laughs> What studies have shown that the brains of psychopaths reveal is there's less activity in areas that process emotion or that are involved in decision making or even that link emotions and decisions and actions. So the orbitofrontal cortex, the frontal part of your brain right above your eye socket, has less activity in a psychopath. And that part of the brain has to do with decision making and actions towards others. And the striatum, which is another part deeper in the brain, that has to do with emotional processing, as well as the amygdala, also in the back of the brain, and another part, the anterior insula, another part of your brain between the frontal and parietal lobes. Those are all involved in processing of emotion and they all show less activity based on images and studies of psychopaths. So when he's talking about doctors being inside of his gulliver, inside of his mind, there have been studies to look inside people's minds. It's interesting that this movie came out decades ago but we are still doing some types of studies like these today. What do you want? Uh, no time for the old in and out, love. I've just come to read the meter. Good. I think what she's trying to do here is she's trying to show a good bedside manner. She's trying to make him comfortable. She's trying to make it so that he will be willing to answer her questions. She's not threatening him in any way. She's presenting him with these things. I think this is also part of an assessment. Has this conditioning worked? When Alex looks at these pictures, is he thinking about ultra-violent things? He mentions sex, the in and out. He mentions breaking eggs, shoving a watch up somebody's behind, but it's not clear that he's ultra-violent. So I think her involvement is furthering an assessment of how this experiment on him has worked. One thing about a clockwork orange that's important to mention is, in terms of psychiatry, many people are scared of psychiatry and they've told me that the images of a clockwork orange come to mind, that psychiatrists have exposed people to these horrible thoughts or horrible ideas and pictures and do terrible things. That's not what happens in a psychiatry office or what happens in a hospital when a psychiatrist comes to visit a patient. Wall Street. Fool and his money are lucky enough to get together in the first place. But why do you need to wreck this company? Because it's wreckable, all right? I took another look at it and I changed my mind. Gordon Gecko really shows traits of narcissism here. He's preoccupied with this fantasy of money and power and accumulating more and more and more. In addition to that narcissistic trait, he also shows the trait of lack of empathy. He is totally disregarding the father in the company here. He's disregarding what he said to people. He's lying, he's manipulating people, and that's all he cares about. This is what some people have termed white collar psychopathy or someone who is not necessarily doing violent crimes, but involved in the financial world or other places. There was a book that came out years ago called Snakes in Suits, which talks about how some people in positions of power show traits of psychopathy. So tell me, Gordon, when does it all end, huh? How many yachts can you water ski behind? How much is enough? It's not a question of enough, pal. It's a zero-sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses. We could look at why does psychopathy even exist. One idea is that it's the survival of the fittest. Those that can take advantage of a situation will. Those that can, in fact, survive, want to survive as best as they can. There's another idea that psychopathy exists because it teaches us how to defend against those things. In even very pure genetic cultures, where there are very few people that come into that genetic pool, there are psychopaths still that arise. And the idea is that perhaps this happens because we need to learn how to defend against it, or again, is there something evolutionarily that a psychopath has that is worth preserving? Some people who rise to positions of power use what they can to get ahead, and that can be a version of psychopathy. Money itself isn't lost or made, it's simply uh, transferred from one perception to another, like magic. Greed is good. Gordon Gecko is the one who, who came up with that. That is the idea that, hey, what I accumulate, that's what matters most. I don't care about other people. 
anybody underneath me. These are just pawns in my game. I'm going to accumulate as much wealth as I can. Greed is good. Caring isn't, it doesn't serve me. And that's what we see in him. No country for old men. What's the most you ever lost on a coin toss? Sir? The most you ever lost on a coin toss. I don't know. So at this point, your hairs are starting to stand on end a little bit, and it feels like you just want to get away from this person. That's a feeling many people describe when they're around someone who's psychopathic. The idea that this guy is literally just toying with the man behind the counter, and he's getting a lot of personal gratification out of it. You see that it's about power. It's about making sure that he can show this person that he's in control. Anton Chugar is just trying to get this guy scared. Call it. Call it, yes. For what? Just call it. Well, we need to know what we're calling it for here. You need to call it. A psychopath is often glib, meaning they will express themselves, but very shallowly. You don't know what's really going on underneath. You see some of that here in the back and forth, the banter, but it's more than banter. It's really an attempt to make this guy distressed and have him feel a lot of fear. What Shugar does here, he essentially makes his decision about killing this guy come down to a coin toss. There's one theory that this might be related to something serial killers do by dehumanizing their victims. The idea is that the coin toss or dehumanizing a victim and not seeing them as a person helps someone deal with what's called cognitive dissonance or the idea that this is wrong and the feeling they might have that this is not okay or the feeling that others might have that this is not okay but by making it all just come down to a coin toss or objectifying somebody, then, then it's all right, it's justified. So that could be what you see here. That might suggest that someone has more caring and awareness than a psychopath might have, but they might know, again, if it relates to them and their goals, that a family member of theirs might be upset by their crimes. So in that sense, maybe they're aware of this and thinking, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, but again, they don't feel it. The dehumanizing helps somebody get through something if there is that cognitive dissonance. It's also a way to continue to make someone very distressed. This guy's life has just been minimized into a coin toss. Or someone who's going to be killed by a serial killer has just been treated as an object. That's also a power and control thing, or could be a power and control dynamic established by the serial killer or by the psychopath. I can't call it for you. Well, it wouldn't be fair. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. There was a criticism of this film when it came out that the character of Shugar was not developed fully. But the fact is that with psychopaths, you don't actually know what's under the surface. You don't get to know them in a deep way. This has to do with that glibness of their expression, pathological lying, just not knowing. Heads in. Well done. The fact that this gentleman might have gotten the coin toss right, and for his lucky sake he did, means that there is a way he could still live. Shugar was not determined to kill him. In a way, again, that's Shugar toying with this guy. He's playing with him. He's literally using him as a pawn in his game for personal gratification. And that is an element of psychopathy. In some of the most severe cases of narcissistic personality disorder, also you can see that lack of empathy for other people. So that's probably what's going on here. It's an element of psychopathy, an element of narcissism in Shugar. Basic instinct. Boxing was fun till Manny died. How'd you feel when he died? I loved him, it hurt. How'd you feel when I told you Johnny Boz had died? I felt like someone had read my book and was playing a game. Catherine is showing signs of histrionic personality disorder. Someone with histrionic personality disorder wants to be the center of attention and they're uncomfortable when they're not. They might use sexual or provocative behavior to become the center of attention. They might use their physical appearance as well to gain someone's attention or affection. You still get the pleasure. Didn't you ever fuck anybody else when you were married, Nick? How'd you know he was married? Maybe I was just guessing. In addition, someone who's histrionic they might have shallow, shifting expression of emotions, or even their speech might be dramatic or in some ways impressionistic, trying to leave someone with a little bit of flair. 
when it comes to Catherine, in terms of showing sexual behavior, provocative behavior, here she is flirting with Nick out in the open. There's the famous crossing of the legs where she exposes herself. That's again using sexuality to gain attention. You want me to take a lie detector test? What's interesting, at the end of this, there is the beating of the lie detector. In some studies, psychopaths actually have less skin conductivity, meaning that there's less of the electrical conduction that goes along the skin that's important when using a lie detector. In fact, because the reliability of a lie detector is not completely accurate, it can't be admissible in court. So it's not out of the question that she would pass a lie detector. What's also possible, although it's not clear, is whether Catherine's a sexual sadist. Sexual sadism refers to someone who derives pleasure from the extreme pain, suffering, or humiliation of someone else. In her case, she is talking about liking what Manny did for her, and there's allusions to violent or rough sex and sexual activity. In addition, we know that she has some tendency towards the more violent when it comes to sex. Catherine potentially is a sexual sadist. There are different degrees and types of sexual sadists. There are characteristics. Sometimes people torture their victims sexually for longer than an hour. Sometimes people have more than one way to torture their victims. How'd you meet Mr. Bias? I wanted to write a book about the murder of a retired rock and roll star. I went down to his club, I picked him up, and I had sex with him. You didn't feel anything for him, you just had sex with him for your book. In the beginning. Research on psychopathy shows that there is this mix of personality disorder traits that can be narcissistic, they can be borderline, they can be histrionic. The classic psychopath is someone who does not care, does whatever he or she wants, doesn't think about how it affects others, uses others, manipulates others, can be glib, can really do whatever they need to to get into a situation to get out of it what they want. So in that sense, Catherine really does show signs of being a psychopath. Ozark. I can't do this. I, I, can't, I can't, Marty, I can't do this. Are you driving? I can't do this. Pull over right now, honey. You shouldn't be driving. <laughs> Wendy, you're our whole life, honey. Sometimes people make decisions, do things that are illegal, and make bad decisions, even when they're not psychopathic or they don't have antisocial personality disorder or some personality disorder. In this case, Wendy had to make this decision in her mind because if she didn't give up her brother, she would risk her own life, her husband's life, and the lives of her children. She chose here to give up her brother so that she could protect her family. The decisions she makes to have him killed, she clearly does care about him. She's crying, she's hysterical about having to make this decision. If she were a true psychopath, this would not be happening. She has no one here to act for, so she's not acting this way in front of anybody. She actively calls her husband to share her grief. So in this case, this is not an example of a psychopath. I can't do it! I can't do this! I can't! What do I stop him? Do I stop him? Maybe just breathe. What are we doing? What am I doing? Oh. Oh, God. Some might argue that Wendy arranged for the killing of Kay Langmore, that she's also doing other bad things, and, and she's developing a coldness to her. And that's quite possible. She might be doing that to survive, which is different than a psychopathic motivation. She's not doing this for her pleasure. She's got to survive. She and Marty are in this. There's no way out. So this is the only way she does this, is to figure out who do I need to kill? Who do I need to keep alive? What do I need to do to survive? That is different than psychopathic behavior, even though she's become more cold, more callous, in showing those psychopathic traits. Thanks so much for watching these clips with me. I hope you learned something, and I look forward to seeing you again.